and you see some of the people who have been logging up here. Um, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, today's uh, E class is on uh, supraventricular tachycardia evaluation and management. <clears throat> the diagnosis of uh, supraventricular tachycardia in children, especially infants and uh, young ones, in the absence of an ECG is a formidable challenge. Uh, it's because the typical history of a paroptimal palpitations are usually absent, and it is the clinical suspicion of tachycardia being responsible for uh, unusual symptoms. Uh, and an attempt to document uh, those tachycardias on ECGs are important. A CT in children is a fairly broad subject. I'm intending to focus today on a particular form of SVT in children. This could be described on the basis of the morphology on the ECG as regular and the narrative RS. The SVT is with uh, white QRS morphology. Uh, the atrial flutters and fibrillation, which can also be considered as SVT, I am conveniently avoiding for today's discussion. Supraventricular in children in the order of their commonness are AVRT, AVNRT, HL tachycardia, PJRT, and JET. Of course, I had excluded atrial factor, fibrillation, and some other forms of white QRS tachycardia in the form of antidromic tachycardia, including Mahim, etc. Uh, these five ones are the subject of discussion today, and they are the commonest in children. Now let's start talking about AVRT, which is atrioventricular reentrant tachycardia. It's also described as orthodromic tachycardia. What is the substrate? What is the substrate for AVRT? The substrate for AVRT is a re-entry circuit that is made up by the normal ventricular conduction system, the AV node, the heel bundle, the right bundle, the left bundles. These ventricular conduction fibers make a part of the re-entry circuit. The re-circuit entry is completed by an accessory pathway, which essentially is an ectopic mass of myocardial tissue, which has retained its conduction properties and which is usually situated superficially at the atrioventricular valve annular. For example, here, the accessory pathway is shown to be located on the left side. The re-entry circuit of AVRT or orthodromic tachycardia consists of ventricular conduction system, an accessory pathway, and intra-atrial conduction system. So this re-entry circuit is rather large, and hence, the circuit responsible for atrioventricular re-entry tachycardia is called macro re-entry tachycardia, where the ventricular conduction, ventricular activation is considered to take place in an orthodromic direction of the impulse, which is from the AV node down into the ventricle. And the atrial activation is considered to be through the antidromic Or, or, or a conduction across the accessory pathway in the reverse direction, and hence the atrial activation takes place, unlike that happens when the sinus node takes over and activates the atria. 
how is the QRS inscribed during AVRT? The ventricular activation is through the normal conduction system. And if the conduction system is normal, it has to have a normal QRS inscribed. Orthodromic activation through the conduction system. If the conduction system is normal, the ventricle is activated normally and hence you have a normal QRS. Once the impulse activates the ventricle, it may climb up, penetrate the accessory pathway and then retrogradely may activate the atria in an abnormal fashion. From, for example, this is the left lateral accessory pathway. So the atrial activation starts abnormally from the left atrium free wall towards medially across the septum and the right atrium. So the completion of the atrial activation resulting in the P wave occurs rather late. That is after the QRS, there is a, there's a time gap when the atrial activation is completed. So you have a distinct QRS and a distinct, usually, uh, usually seen P waves after the QRS. So you have a distinct interval between the QRS and the P wave. The P waves happening abnormally. which result in an abnormal P waves in the form of usually the inverted P waves. And they happen after a distinct period of time, which is usually more than about 70 to 80 milliseconds. So the RP interval during atrial ventricular re-entry tachycardia is usually more than 70 to 80 milliseconds because the atria are activated after a period of time from the ventricular activation. The next common supraventricular tachycardia in children is atrioventricular nodal re-entry tachycardia. What is the substrate in AVNRT? The substrate lies in the perinodal region, peri-AV nodal region. The fibers in the peri-AV nodal region are functionally dissociated into two regions, a region where the impulse conducts from the atrium to the ventricular to a slower a pathway which has a shorter refractory period and another region where the impulse may conduct faster with a longer refractory period. So this functional dissociation of the peri AV nodal region comprising two pathways, a slow pathway and a fast pathway called a dual physiology of the AV node is a substrate for AV re-entry. So what happens if the re-entry circuit is set in the peri AV nodal region? This re-entry circuit as compared to AVRT is small. In the AVRT it was a macro re-entry circuit. In the AVNRT it is a small re-entry circuit consisting of a, a limb which conducts slowly with a shorter refractory period and conducts fast with a longer refractory period. When the re-entry is set in The impulse may get exited superiorly to activate the atrium and gets exited downwards to activate the ventricle. Because the structure is small, the exits take place almost simultaneously, which would give rise to a distinct ECG pattern. And what is that? Because the exits are occurring at almost the same time, you have 
P and the QRS occurring at the same time. So when the QRS is being inscribed, the P is also getting inscribed. So the sine qua non of AVNRT is the P and the QRS occurring at the same time. The P waves may actually get hidden into the QRS or they may barely be seen soon after the QRS and rarely the P waves can be just before the QRS. So in general, if you have a difficulty in figuring it out whether the P waves are there or not, in a regular narrow QRS tachycardia, the diagnosis is almost always AVNRT. So this is the QRS and the P wave. Once the P and the QRS are inscribed, the next QRS and the P takes place through the slower pathway. And hence, you have a longer P to R and shorter RP. So this is what is called typical AVNRT, which is slow and the fast. So the slow is P to the QRS is quite long, as much as the RR in four. That is the slow component. And the QRS and the P, which are occurring simultaneously, is the fast component. So AVNRT is usually typical and it's also called slow fast form of AV nodal VNT. So this dual AV nodal physiology is a substrate for AVNRT. The characteristics of AVNRT are the P lies within the QRS. The P is either barely seen or seen as a pseudo or a pseudo S. The RP interval is shorter than 70 to 80 milliseconds. The next common SVT in children is atrial tachycardia. So what is the substrate here? Normally, the atria and the ventricles are driven by the impulses generated by the SA node. The SA node is situated in a normal heart in the right atrium, in the superior and the lateral region at the junction of the SVC and the RA. The propagation of the impulse is such that you have so-called normal P waves inscribed on the ECG. What are the normal P waves? In the limb links, the P waves are upright except in AVR. Those P waves are conducted to the ventricle with a physiological delay at the AV node, having a normal PR interval. And if the conduction system of the ventricle is normal, you have a narrow QRS. So, if the atrium, instead of the sinus node, if the rhythm, instead of the sinus node, is driven by an abnormal ectopic focus, which fires faster than the sinus node would capture the atrium in an abnormal fashion, resulting in the P waves which are different from the normal P waves. So, the, in the atrial tachycardia, the substrate is a region inside one of the atria which can have an abnormal automaticity, faster than the sinus now, and activates the atria in an abnormal fashion, resulting in abnormal P waves. The PR interval is determinant on, in addition to the rate of the atrial firing, the distance from the ectopic focus to the AV node. So, in an ectopic atrial tachycardia, you have abnormal P waves. You have abnormal P waves, 
and you may have a abnormal PR interval and you may also have changing PR interval. The commonest atrial ectopic focus causing atrial tachycardia resides in the right atrium. More than three-fourths of the times, the atrial tachycardia arises from the right atrium. In the right atrium, they commonly arise from Pista terminalis. They may arise from the serious osteum or the serious body, and occasionally they can arise from tricuspid annulus. One fourth of the time, the atrial tachycardia in children can also arise from the from the left atrium, typically from the left pulmonary vein osteum. They may also arise from left atrial appendage. Occasionally, atrial tachycardia focus may arise from the mitral annulus. Depending on where is the ectopic focus driving the atrial tachycardia, you have the P waves morphology, which can be abnormal. PR intervals may change. And what is more important is there can be more P waves than the QRS in case some of the atrial impulses are not conducted to the ventricles. This is a hallmark if in a regular narrow QRS tachycardia, if you have more P waves than the QRS, it's diagnostic of atrial tachycardia, which is impossible to happen in AVRT because the P waves are connected to the QRS. It is extremely rare, it is extremely rare to have P waves more than QRS in the NRT. Now let's talk about EJRT. It's also called Kumen's tachycardia, who described it for the first time. The other synonyms of PJRT are persistent or permanent or incessant or recurrent junctional reciprocating tachycardia. It's an important tachycardia because it is very difficult to treat it. It's usually refractory to medical therapy. If it happens in infants and children, it usually leads to tachycardia or myopathy because of its incessant nature, slower tachycardia, not actually leading up to palpitations or syncope. A slow tachycardia, persistent or permanent may cause tachycardiomyopathy. What is the substrate for PJRT? PJRT is also an accessory pathway mediated tachycardia. We have seen this cartoon when I discussed about AVRT, wherein we had an extra pathway or an accessory pathway, which is an ectopic mass of myocardial fiber. In PJRT, this is also an accessory pathway, but it typically resides in the right postural septal or the left postural septal region. So the location of the accessory pathway of the PJRT is in the postural septal region. It has another characteristic property and that is this pathway conducts only retrogradely. Unlike the usual accessory pathways where the conduction can also be along the accessory pathway down to the ventricle which would lead to WPW pattern. Unlike those accessory pathways, the PGRT accessory pathway conducts only retrogradely and it conducts slowly. So because it conducts only retrogradely, the tachycardia that is seen on the ECG has the P waves which are inverted. Unlike in avian NRT, this is not the fast pathway. This is a slow pathway. And hence, the P waves occur 
quite late after that you are you have a inverted p wave occurring quite late after the qr and hence it would lead to long rp tachycardia so you have a inverted p wave and almost normal pr interval in pgrt and that may resemble an atrial tachycardia next common tachycardia especially in the post operative setting is junctional ectopic tachycardia what is the substrate normally the perinodal area or a junctional area is electrically suppressed the automaticity is much less than what is seen in this for example in the sinus node however certain injuries or inflammation of the perinodal region may arise to heightened automatic automaticity of that area and this would now drive the rhythm depending on how is the conduction in the ventricles and in the atrium you would have the qrs and the p wave if each time junction is able to conduct to the ventricle you will have as many ventricular activation as there are junctional fire if the junction fires and each time it conducts to the atrium as well so you will have as many p waves as there are qrs and because the atrial activation is retrograde you will have the p waves inverted it may not be necessary that there are as many atrial activation as there are ventricular activation because it depends on whether the pulses arising from the junction were able to activate the atria so depending on whether atria and the ventricle are activated in the similar fashion you will have the patterns for example if if the atria are activated because of the junctional firing the p wave can be inverted and and because the atrial activation is away from the septum in both the directions the activation of the atria activation time of the atria is short because as the impulse is propagating towards the left atrium it also propagates towards the right atrium and hence the completion of atrial activation is within short time due to lead to not only inverted but also narrow p waves they may lie within the qrs as it is seen in avian rt the p waves may be less in number than in qrs if some of the impulses are unable to be going upwards and activating the atria if the conduction system of the ventricle is normal qrs is narrow so very quickly what i said here if you have a tachycardia which is regular regular and narrow see for two things whether the p waves are visible or no if the p waves are not seen are difficult to be seen in a case of a narrow qrs tachycardia it can be fairly certain that this is avian rt because in avian rt you have the p waves getting inscribed almost at the same time as the qrs and the p waves lie within the qrs or soon after the qrs if the p waves are seen the next question could be whether the p and the qrs are equal in number or there are more p waves if there are more p waves it could be an atrial tachycardia if p waves and the qrs are occurring at the uh, in the same numbers the next question is 
what is the RP interval? If you see a P wave clearly, and the RP interval is longer than the PR interval, you call it as a long RP interval, and, and we discuss that is the hallmark of PGRD, and sometimes it can be there in atrial tachycardia. If the R, if the P waves are seen, and they are not so far placed, they are within 80 to 100 milliseconds. That can be called as a short RP interval. In addition to AV and RT, AV and AV RT uh, can be a differential diagnosis. So essentially, in AV and RT, you do not clearly see the P waves, or there can be a pseudo or a pseudo S pattern. If you see clearly a P wave situated way out from the QRS, it's a PJRT or atrial tachycardia. If you could see P waves barely and little after the QRS, it could be AVRT. And in a child, if you have a regular narrow QRS tachycardia, if the P waves are seen just outside the QRS, most often it's AVRT. You always compare those P waves in case if you have got a sinus with an ECG. In AV NRT, the P is within the QRS. If the P is just outside the QRS, it could be AVRT. And if the P wave is quite outside the QRS, it is probably uh, PGRT. Now let's quickly look at some cases. It's a boy, 15 year old boy, recurrent palpitations. What is the diagnosis? Uh, I have typically chosen without the grid so that you know we can concentrate more upon the, the morphology of the QRS and the T. Now what is it? This is a regular narrow QRS tachycardia. Do you see the P waves? These are all T waves. You don't see the P waves. So if you have a regular narrow QRS tachycardia and the P waves are not really seen, the most common diagnosis here is AVNRT. Now let's look at this. What is this another boy with a regular narrow QRS to keep on? Now what is happening? The QRS seems to be normal. However, after the QRS, just after the QRS, you have an inscription. And if you see carefully, there's hardly any interval between the end of the QRS to this inscription. For example, in lead to this can be called as a pseudo S pattern. In the AVR, you see this inscription is called a pseudo R pattern. So if you have a regular narrow QRS tachycardia, and if there are pseudo S or a pseudo R pattern, almost always the diagnosis is. AVNRT. Now let's look at another girl here. She's about 17 years old who has this recurrent palpitations. Um, how do we characterize the VCG morphology? This is a fast, regular narratoristic tachycardia. Do you see P waves? Yeah, you see some P waves. This is here. These are the waveforms which are altering the T wave morphology. And then the so called RP interval and the PR interval, they seem to be similar. So it is really not like a long RP. At the same time, this P is not just at the end of the QRS. So this is not like a short RP, not also like a very long RP. This falls in between the AV and RT and the PGRT. It may not be PGRT because there you really have a long RP and a very short PR. Uh, here it is in between. So if you have a P wave, which are not just after the QRS or not very late after the QRS, 
the diagnosis is usually a AVRT. How about this? This is a young boy about eight years old, recurrent palpitations. How do we read the CCG? We read the CCG as regular and narrow QR is tachycardia. How about the P waves? I am unable to see the P waves clearly. What is so remarkable about this ECG apart from a very rapid rate? It is the significant ST segment depression and the T wave abnormalities in the form of an inversion. So, this is the ST segment depression and the T wave abnormality. If you have a young patient, the recurrent palpitations, a regular narrow QR is tachycardia, even though the P waves are not seen, but if the ST segment depression is very significant, this is also a diagnostic criteria for AVRT. Now, what is happening uh, with the P waves here, which should have been seen as we had discussed in AVRT? Instead of being seen after the QRS, the P waves are falling on the ST segment and they distort it, they pull it down. So, even if you don't see a P wave in a young patient, if you have a regular narrow QRS tachycardia and if that is associated with the significant ST segment depression, you can be almost certain that tachycardia is an orthodromic tachycardia or an AVRT or the tachycardia using an accessory pathway in a retrograde direction. Basically, because of that ST segment depression and that is because of HCL activation occurring after the QRS during the ST segment and pulling it down. And, and sometimes these patients during the sinus rhythm may exhibit the pre-excitation pattern which is again the diagnostic for the diagnosis of AVRT. How about this? Another young boy who has recurrent palpitations. What is the CCG shown? A regular narrow QR is typical. RP we have maybe but not very clear. But what is so very remarkable again? ST segment depression. Global ST segment depression, except in AVR. For example, during the sinus rhythm, if you see like this, it is considered to be diagnostic of left main coronary artery disease. However, during the tachycardia, especially in a young patient, if we have such direct QRS tachycardia and such significant ST segment depression, you may not think it is cardiac ischemia, but you can be certain that this is an orthodromic tachycardia using accessory pathway. And again, this patient also has had basal pre excitation pattern. How about this ECG? Is a regular narrow QRS tachycardia. What is happening with the P waves? We indeed see the P waves. How are these P waves? They are seen almost distinctly and they are not within the QRS. They are occurring after a period of time from the completion of the QRS. So unlike in AV and RT, these P waves are falling after 80 to 90 milliseconds from the QRS. And hence, this is AVRT. How about this? This is a narrow QRS tachycardia, but it's quite irregular. What you are noticing that there are P waves and then the PR interval is changing and maybe the P waves are also changing in morphology. So this is either an ectopic atrial tachycardia or a multifocal atrial tachycardia resulting in changing PR interval and changing RR interval. So if you have a narrow QRS tachycardia if the PR interval is changing or RR interval is changing and if the P waves are distinctly seen is almost always atrial tachycardia. And if you see more P waves than the QRS, then it becomes diagnostic for atrial tachycardia. 
How about that? What is happening? This is a very rapid neurocular tachycardia recorded in a child. Uh, look at the RR intervals. They are quite regular. There are certain inscriptions here, for example, in Lingy 2. The QRS are happening in a regular fashion rapidly. However, what appears to be T wave is not actually T wave because these waveforms are placed at different positions with respect to the QRS. Here it is closer. Here it is little at the distance. Here it is placed really far from the QRS and here it is not associated. So these waveforms are less in numbers than in QRS and these are inverted and it may be because of the P waves. So you have more QRS which are narrow and less P waves. So this is diagnostic of junctional tachycardia. The junction is firing and it's activating the ventricle every time. The impulse generated at the junction are activating the atrium retrogradely in a venti back fashion. So one junction activated the atrium fast. The next junctional beat activated the atrium a little slower. The other one much slower and later on it failed to get conducted. So there are more QRS which are narrow than the P waves is a hallmark of junctional tachycardia. How about this tachycardia? Look at the morphology V1 uh, belongs to the child less than about one year old. Now what is happening? Well, if you see these two RS are quite normal for a baby. This rate is, is faster but sometimes you may consider this a normal for the baby. And then if you see the P waves here, for example, typically in 2 3 area, those P waves are inverted. This can be an ectopic atrial tachycardia, but the fact that this is seen throughout the day, throughout the week, almost in the incessant form, we understood earlier that this form of a tachycardia could be because of a characteristic accessory pathway which conducts retrogradely and slowly and we call that as Hummel's tachycardia or PGRT. So this is a characteristic PGRT in a young child who continuously had this tachycardia and now is suffering from tachycardiomyopathy. How about this? There's a PQRS and there's a PQRS and there looks like an atrial ectopy and the QRS. Here is a PQRS, PQRS and it seems like an atrial ectopy. So this could be an atrial ectopy and then runs into atrial tachycardia. However, if you notice this happening again and again, and sometimes sustain tachycardia for a long, long time. Again, it tells you that this is not actually atrial tachycardia. Even though some beats may suggest that there is an atrial ectopy, this is indeed a PGRT. A PGRT presents this way several times. It may not be incessantly going on, but it may happen incessantly in showers. For example, the short burst of a tachycardia is a short episode of a PGRT. Like that, it may happen again and again and again, which is equivalent to happening it throughout. So if you have an inverted P wave happening way after the QRS, and if that is seen during the tachycardia, that is called PGRT. This is another PGRT. Why do we call a PGRT here? It is a regular 
Narakuwa is typically. Is it rapid? No. It is hardly about 120 beats per minute. So usually the patient is not symptomatic in PGR. Very often the rate is slower. Patient is able to tolerate this tachycardia quite often. It is the incessant nature of this tachycardia cause, causes depletion of cardiac sources of energy that may lead to cardiomyopathy. Very often a PGRT is misdiagnosed as an ectopic atrial tachycardia in the setting of cardiomyopathy, but it is it is due to the accessory pathway and therapy for this tachycardia may reverse cardiomyopathy. Now, let us look at this. What is happening? RR intervals are fairly regular. The so called P waves which are inverted are way out from the QR. This is a long RPTK cardio. And if you see this happening again and again, what should be your diagnosis? You may say PGRT. However, if you look more closely, what is happening? Ara is irregular. Here, this ara is longer than this ara. And what is most important here, there are more P waves than there are ara. If there are more P waves than there are RR, it cannot be PGRT. It is atrial tachycardia. Because in PGRT, the tachycardia is a re entry tachycardia. The P and the QRS are associated with each other. But if there is a continuous tachycardia, and there are more P waves, even if they appear to be a long RP tachycardia, PJRT is not the diagnosis, then it's an atrial tachycardia. So this helps in, in treating the arrhythmia. This is an atrial tachycardia, which has a different approach of therapy as compared to the PJRT. In another five minutes, I would like to be covering the management part. Uh, before I cover up uh, the management part, uh, I would like to tell you, if you read this Europace article published in 2013, uh, your concepts regarding the diagnosis of SMT and most importantly, the pharmacological and non-pharmacological therapy of arrhythmias in the pediatric population uh, becomes very clear. I strongly recommend this article. You will get great insight into the SVTs in children. The acute treatment of hemodynamically stable regular narrow QR cardia in infants and children may involve vagal manuals in the form of ice immersion or gastric tube immersion. insertion. Uh, Occasionally, you may resort to transesophageal atrial drive pacing. Adenosine is almost always effective, except in some atrial tachycardia when you are treating the narrow tachycardia. Um, the doses are written here. Verapamil is another choice, but its cardiodepressant action must be taken into account. Even though the the IV forms of plecanide and propofenone are not available presently. Uh, the capsule forms of these uh, medicines are available freely. You may always consider amidaron if one of these agents are not helping. If there was an episode of a regular narrow QR tachycardia, a single episode, or if the episodes are happening 
only rarely, once a year or so. And during the sinus rhythm, if you have no pre-excitation or a WPW pattern, especially in a child more than five years of age, even if you don't do anything, that is okay because that is what is a class one recommendation. You do not have to treat a regular narrow QR stachycardia happening very, very rarely or only one episode. You may just be assured. And only if there is a recurrence of those, you may consider therapy. You may resort to another approach in this group, and that is to have a pain in a pocket, which could be flecanide or a diltiasm or a propanol in a child. You may not consider some definitive therapy like a catheter ablation in such a group. However, if you have documented infrequent or a recurrent supraventricular tachycardia, which is associated with the ventricular dysfunction, you don't resort to any medical management. You straight away consider catheter ablation. If there is supraventricular tachycardia and more than five years of age, even if the patient is seeming to be asymptomatic on chronic antiarrhythmic therapy, one may actually consider catheter ablation because exposing the child for chronic anti-arrhythmic therapy may not be uh, desirable. However, if, if the patient is really young, including infants, you consider catheter ablation only when these drugs are not effective. So, Less than five years of age, you may treat with some anti admits but after the five years of age, um, because of the safety and the efficacy of the catheter ablation, you may not advise uh, the children to go on anti admit therapy. If, however, less than five years of age, if the SVT is controlled with the conventional anti admits you should not consider catheter ablation because less than five years of age increases the risk for catheter ablation. More than five years of age, the safety is quite acceptable. Very quick word about the WPW pattern. If the WPW pattern is associated with the recurrent and the symptomatic SVT beyond the age of five years, catheter ablation should be the choice. However, one can consider flecanide or a propofenol. If the WP pattern is associated with recurrent symptomatic SVT less than five years of age, you consider catheter ablation only after you have tried medications like flecanide or propofenol. If there is a pre-excitation pattern and, and if the patient has been resuscitated from a cardiac arrest, whether there was a documentation of a tachycardia or no, this becomes an indication as a class one indication for catheter ablation. Even in the absence of a documented tachycardia, the surface ECG shows WPW pattern. A less serious condition of a WPW pattern, instead of an aborted sudden cardiac arrest, the patient had syncope. There can be many reasons for syncope in a WPW pattern, and hence, in the absence of the documentation of the tachycardia, this patient needs to undergo an EP study to look at certain properties of the accessory pathway and then should be considered for catheter ablation if on an EP study the accessory pathway was found to be responsible for syncope. An asymptomatic child, less than five years of age, if there is a WPW pattern, one should not recommend any anti-arrhythmic research or any catheter ablation, even if there's a family history or even if there is an underlying structural heart disease. However, if the patient, if the person is asymptomatic, more than five years of age, if the pre excitation pattern is, is, is persisting, there is a small possibility of patient developing a tachycardia or a syncope or an aborted arrest, a very, very small possibility. So even in an asymptomatic pre excitation, even if there is no recognized tachycardia, 
there is a scope for a catheter ablation provided you have counseled very well with the parents of the patient that this can be considered provided uh, they accept a small risk associated with the procedure. So that ends my presentation for the day. Um, I'm going to be here around. If you have any questions, you are welcome.